So the next speaker is Karl Czernilia, the director of the division microbiology from the National Center for Toxicological Research from FDA. Now, how come, Karl, that we got in touch? The reason was that I wanted to make a session on microbiome and nanomedicine. And so we invited how many people? I think about eight. And everyone said, this is a topic I don't speak to. So we came to the conclusion that best would be I have an expert, and this is Carl, and that Carl would give a talk today in the last session of the, or in the second last session. And I'm very grateful that you have made the long trip to Basel to enlighten us in this field. Well, thank you so much, Biad. It's been uh, such a scientifically uh, stimulating conference. Uh, I've learned so much. I hope to contribute this afternoon on the microbiome piece, but, but boy, it's been so motivating to me uh, to learn so much about uh, nanomaterials and nanomedicine. So I guess it's going to be intimidating to me a little bit because I'll be speaking to an audience who is in a field I know that not much about compared to the microbiome where I've been in the microbiome space for over 30 years. So I've been doing this research for a long time. So I thought I would, I thought I would start out by by basically making the connection between the micro and the, and the macro world. I guess I should put in the nano world as, as well here, but, but uh, you know, planet Earth is a microbial world. And you know, throughout history, microorganisms have modified the fundamental conditions that has enabled life on our planet. So this is kind of a fundamental concept of how microorganisms actually contribute to all the essential ecosystems in this world and how you can link micro events, uh, things we can't see to the naked eye without high powered microscopes, to macro events like global change, warming, food, food security issues, antibiotic resistance, et cetera. So there are these connections and these links to that. And, and over the last decade, the, you know, the microbiome has emerged as one of the hottest areas of biomedical research. And so it represents a new frontier in environmental toxicology, human toxicology, and certainly uh, I'm learning more and more about how it's linked to nanotoxicology, and that's what I'll be talking about today. But it's also very, very important, uh, even getting back to one of the questions that was just asked in this session on regulatory agencies, it's, it's very important for regulatory agencies to effectively integrate new and emerging science into risk assessments. And in modernizing toxicology, it's very important to uh, put the microbiome now in the toolbox, which we're doing in my own particular laboratory, which I'll explain later. Okay. So, so this is the hot, hot area. If you just look at the, the number of uh, publications since the, uh, the Human Microbiome Project was initiated, uh, you can see how uh, just an explosion of activity. And as of uh, April 20th, uh, 2017, I also went and checked to see uh, what papers have been published in the nano arena compared to microbiome. In other words, uh, I used, uh, in, you know, the key words of uh, uh, nanomaterials, nanoparticles, uh, nanotoxicology, microbiome, microbiota, et cetera, to try to see how many papers. And you can see uh, there have been an increase in, the, in papers in this particular field, but certainly not near uh, the amount that's in, uh, uh, in the literature for the total microbiome field. Okay. And there's many applications uh, that have been found since the uh, initiation of the Human Microbiome Project in uh, nutrition, drug, and food safety, and environmental health, and, and precision medicine. Okay. Uh, and there's even books, you know, I, you know I, th these are the publications, but there's, there's even books on the microbiome diet. If you're interested in that, there's a journal, Microbiome. And so if you follow and you read these books, 
it's pretty interesting if you, you know, you eat the lean food, fresh fish, uh, get all your vegetables, uh, certainly your uh, fermented foods, the, the kefirs in them, I mean, the, the, and the kimchi and the sauerkraut, etc. Uh, you can kind of get the uh, Statue of David look, you know, versus if you go the more uh, traditional uh, westernized type diet, you know, you could maybe uh, not look as good as what Michelangelo uh, produced. Now, what is the microbiome? And this is important. I'm going to try today because it's obviously we don't have a lot of time. So I'm kind of going to give you the Cliff Notes version of the microbiome or uh, for uh, the younger said me, the speed dating. So I'm going to go quick uh, through this. But I think it's important uh, for us to have some common definitions. Definitions are important. And the ecological definition is kind of the biome piece of the definition of the microbiome. It's a collection of microorganisms. Uh, within, a, within the human body, if you're talking about the human microbiome, so it's an ecosystem. And the other important point, if you look at this particular uh, slide, is the fact that it's not only bacteria, that's what we generally focus on, but there's also archaea, which are methogenic bacteria, uh, fungi, viruses, and single-cell eukaryotes that live in a human habitat. So you can't forget the others. But mainly, 99.9% .9 of the human biosphere, the microbiome, is bacteria. But still, you get what we call the mycobiome, which is fungi, or the virome, which are viruses. And then we have the genetic uh, definition, which is the entire collection of genes found in all the microbes associated with the particular host. So the key on this particular slide is the fact that we're more microbial than human on a cell basis. You can see from this slide that we have anywhere from three uh, to 10 more times uh, the amount of microbial cells, in other words, 100 trillion cells compared to human cells. Then on a genome standpoint, uh, there's uh, almost 400 times. But the other important point that I always like to make and we talk about the superorganism, the combination between the human genome and the microbial genomes, is the fact that the uh, human genome is relatively static, whereas, uh, whereas the uh, microbial genome, uh, microbiome, uh, there's a lot of plasticity can change due to environmental conditions. So there's a big difference there, and that's the reason what's what makes us what we are in a lot of ways. Okay. So again, I, t I like to always give history. I don't, we don't have a lot of time for that today, but I, I do a lot of teaching at the medical school and everything, and I kind of like to be a bit, uh, give background because sometimes we forget about the, the seminal discoveries of others. So in some ways, this microbiome field is not a new field. Uh, from the initial uh, observations of uh, Leeuwenhoek all the way down to, uh, you know, Koch and postulates. And, uh, but the, the name itself, the microbiome, actually came from uh, uh, Joshua Lederberg uh, when he was d involved in the human microbiome, um, human pro genome project, and he called the, um, the, the microbiota piece of this the ex human extended genome, which now became known is the human genome in uh, human microbiome in 2001. And the other important date is 2007 is the Human Microbiome Project. And this, the, the Human Microbiome Project, was, uh, which is an international venture, there's many groups around the world involved, but this was a really a game changer in this whole field because uh, they characterized and identified a collection of human-associated microorganisms from, from many anatomical sites. And, uh, did inter-individual and inter individual alterations and how they link that to both human health and disease. And uh, so that's created uh, what we, even with that information that's come out of there, there's a huge, what I call a microbiome host interaction, uh, broad deep research space. And there's some really some key, key questions. One of the parts of my title slide is gaps, and I'll link this to nano, uh, toxicology, nanomedicine later, but the fact is that uh, there's still a lot of debate of what we actually define as a healthy uh, microbiome. What does that truly mean? Uh, certainly, uh, what are the drivers of this, uh, of this uh, micro microbiome stability or instability and, suspe and susceptibility and the health and risk of disease over a person's lifetime? Basically, uh, I mean, put it in simple terms, are the bacteria the the, uh, the drivers or the passengers involved, you know, I mean, that's, that's really the enemy because sometimes we link a lot of it, but maybe it's just they're not, on, they're just the passengers in these events and not necessarily driving the, driving the SUV. 
also, what are the key genes, protein, and metabolites are active in the myelin? What are these functions? There's this whole new field of trying to find biomarkers which can link very uh, specifically these uh, kinds of issues. And how do we test causality of the microbiome? Uh, can therapeutic interventions like uh, the pre-probiotics and fecal microbial treatments cure or ameliorate specific diseases? I mean, there's a lot of play in this field now, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, like fecal microbial transplants might work sometimes for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Clostridia difficile patients and sometimes not. So why is that? Some, uh, why does um, transplants uh, don't work in IBD patients, you know, but they do work? So there's a lot of areas in that. And certainly this whole areas of models, uh, both uh, animal models, mathematical and silico models, et cetera. Okay. So basically the, we're, uh, there's a patina of microorganisms on our body, which uh, certainly the GI tract is one of the major players and tends about 10 to the 14th uh, organisms in about a thousand different species in the GI tract. But basically, wherever you can put a swab and, and, uh, and basically swab and then do a sequence, you're going to get uh, microbial uh, signatures and you'll see these kinds of numbers. Okay. So obviously, the, the, the biggest play was uh, certainly uh, from the Human Microbiome Project, about 55% of the funding was actually uh, pretty much dedicated to GI tract research. So with that, uh, you can see some of the outcomes of the linkage between, uh, relationship between the gut microbiota and health and, and intestinal diseases. So there is this issue of, of, of how do you can therapeutically manipulate from going from a chronic disease state. You can see some that are listed uh, there. Uh, like obesity, bowel diseases, uh, cancer, to uh, to more healthy state in the typical functions of the host physiology, metabolism, and immune function. So this is a big key, and you can see the way this arrow is shifted. How do we go from one to the other? Okay. Okay. Now, the other important aspect, I think, and this gets into where I'm leading to in all of this particular field, is the fact that if you're in, uh, in nanomedicine and you're going to develop a laboratory in... Uh, in, uh, in my, to do microbiome research or certain things you need to consider. The first thing is, is what we call individual variability. And this is a principal component analysis plot where uh, you can see that uh, geography makes a difference. Uh, the location of our body sites makes a difference in the type of microorganisms. And within each location, there's, there's differences. So if I took a, a sample, I'll just say a, a fecal sample from everyone in this room, I'd get a variety of uh, microbial signatures. So when you're setting up research, uh, the question comes, and we've had a lot of debate about this, when you're doing studies, suppose you were going to do a nano drug study, would you sample individuals or would you do composite samples to get that? And so there's a lot of questions of which way to go, and that hasn't been determined yet of, of, do, of getting the complexity of the, the, micro, uh, the microbiome as doing compositing everybody or doing individuals that look at individual variability. So that's, that's the take-home point there. Also, age is very important. And the take-home point in, in setting up studies is, is two things. Gender makes a difference in microbiome, male, female. Also, age makes a difference in the composition of the microbiome. And one of the fundamental principles that we learned from the Human Microbiome Project is that there's what's, what's truly changed the microbiome in the Western world? You know, uh, uh, those who eat. Uh, and basically, it's four things. One is industrial processed food. The second thing is antibiotic usage, over, over usage of antibiotics. The third is, is the way we rear children. Uh, you know, C-section versus uh, a vaginal birth makes a difference, and also uh, uh, the infant formula versus breastfed milk. So these four factors, I mean, there's many others, but these four factors are really have changed that. So when you're doing studies, uh, it's very important to consider uh, when you're, whether you're doing animal studies or human volunteer studies is to uh, get, because there is a difference in the microbiota, and there's an area of vulnerability at an early age in the microbiota. That's so, you, so when you get these kinds of assaults on the microbiome at an early age or at an older age, uh, sometimes I don't like to see, I see elderly, and there's, but I'd rather say our golden, our golden years, you know. There is a change uh, we, in our... In our uh, in our microbiome, uh, especially in reduced biodiversity, stability, our immune function, intestinal motility, all these things change. Okay. So now, when we get these kind of environmental exposures, 
and uh, specifically, let's say, nanodrugs or nanoparticles, uh, there are effects on the microbiome. And there's two uh, basic questions. Is, does the nanomaterials significantly perturb the microbial community composition and function? If it does, what are the associated health effects of the shift? And, concourse, uh, and then the other aspect is, do the microbiota metabolize these nanomaterials? And if so, what are the consequences of these novel metabolites? So these are some fundamental uh, questions. And uh, the third overriding of that is individual variability. So basically, there are gaps in this particular field as, as well. Uh, and this is where I would encourage the students and the postdocs in the audience and the, the young prof uh, system professors who are getting involved in this field. There's a paucity of studies. When I went through all of these papers, there's a paucity of studies on the, uh, the effects of nanomaterials on, on uh, in vivo systems, whether you're talking about mammals, uh, non-human primates, uh, rats, etc. Most of it's are in vitro studies. That's what you see. Secondly, there's insufficient data on the exposure of uh, the intestinal microbiome on the, on the diversity of functions. In other words, when it, when it gets into the, uh, the GA tract, if we're getting a drug, uh, what is the actual uh, amount that actually gets there and does it affect the composition? And the, uh, and, and the, af the other aspect is, is when we're looking at the microbiota, is the intestinal microbiota uh, is, are we looking at just the fecal content or versus the organisms that are associated with the, uh, the lining of the intestinal tract, which could be the most, most important. So uh, today I won't have time to obviously talk about the work that we're doing at NCTR, uh, but we have a number of projects at the National Center for Toxicological Research, uh, the FDA, on uh, various projects related uh, to the microbiome and nano uh, materials interactions, uh, nano silver, graphene, uh, and a wide variety of other compounds and the different anatomical sites. So I hope at the next conference uh, that I can send, uh, uh, we have travel budgets, if I could send some of my students and uh, postdocs and PIs to talk about these things. It would be a wonderful experience. So basically what I just want to finish, I, only, I don't have much time left, but uh, what I'd like to do is just quickly say, what would you do if you're going to put this in the toolbox, uh, the microbiome, and you're setting up a, a nano program to look at the mic microbiome? Obviously, when you're doing toxicity evaluation, this is the traditional uh, tests that are done. Uh, but also now, microbial, microbiome toxicity and other microbiological effects uh, are, should be included in the toolbox. And basically, uh, I was asked a question in, uh, Carl, if you had the ideal situation with dollars, budgets, and everything, how would you really do a microbiome study? Good question. And we implemented this, actually. I was fortunate enough to get the funding with the National Toxicology Program to actually do all our studies using this type of an approach. So I wanted to share that with you today because I think it's critically important if you're starting a lab, I think this would be the gold standard. Now, first of all, you, there, is the, you know, there, there you are uh, taking the sample. And usually you, when you're doing human samples, it's usually fecal specimens. So then you can do uh, total DNA extraction. You can do the uh, uh, 16S RNA approach, next generation sequencing, and some, basically all the molecular in, culture independent methods, and also the whole genome shock one sequence. So you can get all the composition data and the function data. And then we also incorporate what we call the metaomics approaches, the metatranscriptome. transcriptome uh, proteomics, metabolomics, and then you incorporate all that to get all this information on the metagenome and then integrate the data. And uh, in the last slide, what I'll do is just show you also what you should include in the toolbox in terms of the methods that are out there, because I think this is uh, critically important as well. And with that, there is a number of uh, in vitro and in vivo and ex vivo methods in my lab at the NCTR. We've done all of these particular methods, except for the gut on the chip method. We haven't evaluated that yet. But these are the types of methods. All of these methods have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, some are more predictive than others. Uh, but, but validation needs to be done on these to truly uh, maybe get it to the, the next level for uh, you know when you're doing regulatory type decisions. But at the same time, I want to make you quite familiar with the, these types of things that are in the toolbox. 
So I have, uh, you know, obviously a lot more that I'd like to say, but I think it's important to me to just to stimulate uh, the field because in, uh, in 16 minutes, you know, you can, can't talk about subjects where you can spend hours on, on each aspect. And that would be wonderful if there's going to be uh, later at dinner. Last night I talked a lot at the people across from me on, on these subjects, so that was kind of stimulating. But I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to thank, thank everyone uh, uh, for your attention and certainly be at for uh, having me here at the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Simon. I'm curious about, uh, about one question uh, related to the microbiota. Um, there's a, for what I understand, there's a lot of discussion in the field about whether the microbiome uh, in, the, in, in the gut, for instance, the microbiota of the gut, uh, can act like a kind of a second brain for the human body. This is uh, being passed in many places. So in the sense that this uh, uh, microbiota can, in fact, generate a lot of different chemical uh, Right. Uh, products that right. have actually different effects in different organs, in the brain, yeah. in neural development, in rats, in offspring. Yeah. So, um, and one of these, one of these uh, uh, issues is whether this, this, this might be related, it, it, it has been postulated very recently that it, must, it, it can be related to whether people is overreacting or having right. changes in conductual right. changes right. or impulse aggressivity and all this kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're asking that question because that brings up a point that I was going to make today. Uh, I just wrote a review on the gut-brain axis, so this, I'm glad you asked it because I think it's so... It's a, it's, I think this is one of the more emerging areas. And, and uh, basically, uh, and the point that I'd like to make is the fact that what happens in the gut can also affect other organs. And the brain is a big one in this brain-gut axis. And getting to your particular point, there's, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of studies. Now, that's an area that's really exploded. I think that's one of the more exciting areas, actually, uh, in, the, in the microbiome arena because it's linked, as you're alluding to, uh, it's, it's linked to neurological disorders, neurobehavioral disorders, and, uh, and neurobehavioral disorders. And, uh, and so it can be uh, very, uh, it's very important. And, you know, when you think about it, if you, only, you know, in your own vocabulary, you know, sometimes you say you have a gut feeling, gut reaction, and, and these types of things, right? We say that. Well, now we know there's a biochemical, a microbiological, we think, uh, to these kinds of things because there's been neurodevelopmental studies, neurological studies, and neurobehavioral studies, which have linked this gut-brain axis. And getting to your point of the metabolism that occurs in the gut, uh, first of all, like short-chain fatty acids that are produced, certain things like butyrate and propionate have been shown to be neuromodulators. Then certainly tryptophan metabolism is quite important in serotonin biosynthesis. So obviously we know how important uh, that is. And then the neurotransmitters like uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, et cetera, all of that is produced by the bacteria in the gut. But then it goes via, there's this bidirectional communication with the vagus nerve. So I'm glad you asked that because that's an important area that's really, and, and so nano would be very important in, in this arena. Yes. Thanks a lot. Okay, you're welcome. Yep. 